year's Bible school theme, unknown to us, but known to him. It's another way of saying the same thing, isn't it? If you have your Bibles, if you would, please turn to James chapter 4. We're resuming in James 4, verse 13. James, as we have said again and again, is very practical. Uh, it is about the practical living uh, life as a believer. Uh, to teach others and <clears throat> how to uh, live for the Lord. And it's just a good place to be, just to put these things into practice. For instance, in the fourth chapter, it tells us, verses 1 through 6, if we humble ourselves, and then verses 7 through 12, submit ourselves to God, then we will be able to trust God with our future. That's the verses that we want to look at tonight. Now this is not saying that we should not plan, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, if you have found James 4 and verse 13, if you're able to, please stand and honor this word tonight. It says, Now listen, you who say... Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag, all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Lord, thank you for your word tonight. I pray that you would speak to each one of us where we live, that we can honor you and give you thanks for what you have given us in Jesus' name. Thank you. So, uh, James, again, very practical, talks about those who would um, uh, make plans uh, about the future. Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry out business, and make money. There are some times uh, in our history when it would appear that you could do that. I'm not so <coughs> sure you could make that claim today uh, that you're going to go anywhere and make money. But nevertheless, um, is this saying, then, that we should never make any plans? No. No. I believe that the Bible does not teach that. Uh, but there are folks out there that say, well, you should never plan. I run into some. You probably have as well. This does not say that we should plan. Proverbs in the um, Old Testament, which has a lot in common with James, as we've noted as we've gone through this series, Proverbs has much to say about making plans, and I just used a concordance and, and just grabbed a few examples here. Uh, it says in Proverbs, the plans of the righteous are just. Well, that sounds like it's a good thing that the righteous have plans. Maybe there's something about those plans that we could learn. Uh, plans, and I'm paraphrasing here, plans benefit from having many advisors. Something uh, valuable about talking over our plans with other people, especially uh, business plans like are described here in verse 13. Sometimes you need to consult people who know about things in, a, in the business or the place where you want to do business. Uh, make plans, Proverbs says, again I'm paraphrasing, by seeking advice. So there's value in advice, but it's also talking about making plans. And then um, Proverbs 21.5, one that I have uh, been meditating on these last several years. Uh, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to um, poverty. <laughs> and that was a verse that uh, God showed me several years ago to spend holding on to. Plans of the diligent. You need to be hardworking and do things, but it says the plans of the diligent. In uh, Psalm 20, it says God may give you the desires of your heart and make your plans succeed. Uh, and then again in Proverbs, uh, we make the plans, but the Lord determines our steps, and it is His purpose that prevails. And herein we just introduce something new into our discussion about making plans. We can make our plans, but it is God's purpose 
that prevails. So it is how we make our plans that matters. And really that's what James is talking about here. I'll come back to that in a minute. Another example of plans and planning in the scriptures. Uh, Paul was one who made plans. He told the Corinthians that his plans were yes and then no, and no and then yes. In other words, he didn't just kind of uh, get up and see whichever way the wind was blowing that particular day, but he had plans and he stuck to them. The consistency that came from integrity. The caution here is to submit to God in all things. That's, again, such a major part of the context here this chapter, verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Submit this area of life to God. Submit your future to God in how we make plans and how we look to the future. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Trust God then uh, with all your life and live your life to the glory of God. Trust God. God with all your life and live your life to the glory of God. Trust God. Why would we trust God? Because he's in control. James has already expressed that. James has already expressed his goodness, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. In other words, God gives good gifts and uh, that he gives generously the wisdom that we need if we'll ask him. Uh, that's back in chapter 1. And so we've already covered some of this. Uh, trust God. Why? Because He's sovereign and because He is in control. And our walk with God includes the surrender of every area of life, and that includes our planning, be they personal plans, business plans, uh, or any other kind of planning. Now this letter, James, or book, if you prefer to refer to it that way, book of James, was written, uh, as we saw all the way back in January in chapter 1, verse 1, it was written to the scattered. They weren't living in Palestine. This uh, would not have been written in any way, shape, or form to people who were working in the temple compound who would have derived priestly income for some other type of work. They had to do business. They had to be farmers. They had to be merchants. They had to be shepherds. They had to be doing some type of work. They had to carry on business somehow in order to provide for their needs. As the Bible teaches us, we're to work uh, for our needs. The Bible says, no work, no eat. Mm -hmm. A good admonition and a good reminder. And work requires planning. The last time I looked carpenter going to build a house without doing some measuring? What's measuring? What's ordering materials? That's planning, isn't it? The farmer's going to put in crops. He's going to do some planning, right? You need to know how much seed you need for how many acres of field of what kind of crop you're going to put in. Uh, going to school requires planning. Uh, figuring out a route all around the state of Ohio requires planning. Um, tearing apart an engine, fixing what's wrong, putting all the little pieces back together without any leftover requires some planning. Does it? Business requires planning. So of course we plan. But he's saying here how we plan is important. So it relates to our motives. You see, pride says it's all up to me. I've got to do it. There's nobody else out there that's going to help me. I've got to do it if I'm going to succeed. And so I'm going to go on to this city or that city I'm going to spend a year there, I'm going to carry on business, and I will make money. You don't know that, James says. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know when the market's going to fall out. You don't know if that employer's going to let you go. You don't know if the jobs will be there, if the income will be enough. You don't know that. But pride says, oh, I can do it. Idolatry says, I have to be in control of this. I've got to control this area of my life. I can't yield my future to somebody else. That's idolatry, isn't it? Pride and idolatry, which go together hand in hand. And pride also uh, desires to brag about what we have, to boast. And James talks about that here in verse 16. You boast and you brag and it's evil because you're taking credit for it. God warned Israel back in Deuteronomy. He said, listen, you're about to go into the promised land. Deuteronomy was written, um, as I paraphrase it, 
when they were on the doorstep of the promised land and God reminded them of everything he'd done for them and everything they needed to do to stay in step with him. He says, listen, when you go into this new land, and it's a wonderful land, and it's flowing with milk and honey, and there's all kinds of prosperity there, and there's all kinds of goodness there, and you're going to go in, you're going to be tempted if you're not careful. If you're not intentional, you're going to be tempted to take credit for it. And say, look at what my hands have done, instead of thanking God for the ability to work and the ability to reap uh, the harvest. And look at our own nation, the uh, decades of prosperity and how greedy we have been and gotten ourselves into so much trouble. That's pride. Because I want to take credit for it. James says that kind of those things either. Don't do that. No. It is how we plan. Life Application Commentary says there are many practical atheists professing Christ but living as though he doesn't exist. Having this sense where we have to have control over it, that idolatry or the pride that wants to take credit for it, is evil, James says. Well, what matters is that we desire His will. His will. And, and here he explains that. He says, um, what you ought to say is this. If it is the Lord's will. If it's the Lord's will, we will enter business. If, if, if it's the Lord's will, we will have this job or that job. Or we will go to this city or live in this place or, or have these things. If it is the Lord's will. And, and desiring His will to the extent that it takes precedence over our priorities. Hey, I'd like that if God would prefer something else, that's what I want. You know, Jesus so powerfully demonstrated that in Gethsemane when He said, Not my will, but yours be done. And we think sometimes, or we might be tempted to think, that that just applies to <coughs> big decisions in life. That may apply to every decision. What do you think? Amen. His will, not mine. And I'm tempted as much as anyone else, maybe even more so, to, to let the little little details of life just kind of slide by as if I'm saying, oh, I've got this, God, over there. I'll just yeah. consult you about the big plans. And he's teaching me more and more. How about you? Teach me more and more to look at those little things, the little decisions. The little issues, the, the minor things that don't seem to matter. If nothing else, isn't it just good to talk it over with him for no other reason than spending the time with him? Trust the Lord with decisions big or small. Um, may our daily activities, even the little things, reveal our faith. Reveal our faith. You know, this is hard for us, and that's nothing new. I found an article this week, came in one of my... Uh, email devotions from uh, C.S. Lewis. And, and, and what it was, um, it was a letter that C.S. Lewis wrote to a friend, Mary Willis Shelburne, uh, back on December 6, 1955. Uh, and you don't need to know all those details, but just listen to what he's talking about here. Uh, it seems that his friend had been applying for a job or had been offered a job at the very least and had turned it down. And he said, you know what, you shouldn't worry about that, um, having refused your job, because there might have been a snag about it, which God knew, and you didn't. So she felt, this friend apparently felt compelled that God didn't want her to have this job. She didn't have peace about it, maybe, or just didn't feel like God was in it, so she turned it down. He said, that's all right, you shouldn't worry about that. Trust what God's telling you. Goes on, the meat of the letter says this. He says, you know what, I feel it impossible to say anything in my comfort or security that wouldn't sound false or, or empty sounding. Um, should I be in your place, and apparently she really needed a job, that this was a really pressing need, and so it sounded kind of odd that she turned it down, but she was trusting God in this. And, and he goes on to say, um, for it is a dreadful truth uh, this state, as you say, of having to depend solely on God is what we dread the most. Wow, I had to go back and read that. The dreadful truth is 
that uh, we have to depend solely on God is what we dread the most. So much about our flesh, about who we are, says, no, I can do it. I've got this. It, I've got control of it. Um, life can put us in a situation sometimes where we don't have that control. Maybe God allows that to teach us something. He, he goes on in his letter. He says, uh, the trouble goes so far back in our lives that it's now so deeply ingrained that we will not turn to him as long as he leaves us anything else to turn to. What honesty. If there's something else we can trust in, hold on to, maybe it's talking to a friend, maybe it's looking something up, maybe it's a degree, maybe it's an advancement in business, maybe it's our bank accounts, whatever else that he leaves us, we're more apt to turn to that than to turn to him sometimes. I suppose all one can say is that it was bound to come in the hour of death and the day of judgment, what else shall we have? Then our own strength and bank accounts and jobs and degrees and accomplishments aren't going to mean anything there. He cuts right, right to the point when he says that. He says, perhaps when those moments come, death and the day of judgment, they will feel happiest who have been forced, however unwillingly, to begin practicing it here on earth. We learn, and it's going to take experiences and things we don't like. Can be health issues, can be financial constraints, can be all kinds of things. You know, um, Jesus even talked about the poor and how they seem to have a better sense of how to trust God. James talked about that too, back in chapter two as well. It is good of Him to force us to learn how to depend on Him here to practice that. Because when we stand before him, there's nothing, as the hymn says, in my hands that I bring simply to the cross. It's good of him to force us, but dear me, how hard to feel that it is good at the time. Mm. I think that really spoke to me as I was studying James and I got this. And he's saying, you know what, we like to take credit for it. We like to think that we're in control. But God is trying to teach us how to be dependent on him. Because his way is good. He is the father who gives good gifts. We can trust him because he's good. Not only because he's in control, but because he's good. So instead, what we ought to say is if it's the Lord's will. Because if it isn't the Lord's will, I don't want it. I've been praying for something this week. I've told a couple of you. I had an opportunity to do a job interview this past week. May have another second follow-up interview coming up. To get a little better paying second job, maybe get rid of two, three, and four and get down to just two. <laughs> Be kind of nice. You know? But if God isn't in it, I don't want it. If it isn't His will, I don't want it. Because it'd be nothing but a mess and a headache and a problem, and, and it'll be a drain and it'll be a stress. But if He's in it, and if He'll put His favor upon it, and He'll open that door, then I'm ready for it. You know, and, and that's that's understanding that God's will is good because He is good. So everything about your life and my life and life itself is in His hands. Uh, it says in verse fifteen, which is the key verse to this passage that we're looking at. If it is the Lord's will, we will live. <laughs> I caught that little part before it goes on to the do this or that part. He says, "If it's God's will, we'll live." We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know if there will be a tomorrow for us. But if it's the Lord's will, we will live. So let's start with the first things first. Life's uncertain. He had said it earlier in the passage. You know, it's just vapors. It's a mist. It's fragile. I like looking at old-timey photographs. Just fun. I don't spend a lot of time doing it. But when there's one that will pop up in a book or on the internet or something, kind of look at it. I'll, I'll look at the people in a crowd and kind of wonder who they were, you know, where they were from, what they did with their lives, uh, maybe what their faith was like, and, and where they uh, went to from that event. A big celebration, you know, and look at the picture and think, well, that was 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Those people aren't living yet. Because life is like that. It's here and it's gone. It's fragile. So value the present. No one knows what tomorrow holds. Yes, we know the one who holds tomorrow. 
But the days are evil, so make the most of the opportunities that we have. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. If someone isn't saved, they need to be saved right now. If someone isn't right with God, they need to get right right now. If someone has to reconcile the brother and sister, they need to do it right now because you have the opportunity now. Don't let it go. Because there are time, and there is a time coming when you won't be able to make things right. Make use of the time that you're given. We shouldn't be deceived into thinking that we have plenty of time left to live for Christ or to enjoy our loved ones or to do what we know we ought to do. Today is the day to live for God. And then no matter what, when our lives end, we will have fulfilled God's plan for us, whether they be many or few days. We'll have done what honors God. If it is the Lord's will, that's how we are taught to think and to pray. If it is the Lord's will, that is how our plans and our prayers and our purposes should be expressed. Listening to uh, what he has to say. Seeking where he would lead and guide. And praying that prayer, Lord, you'll lead me here where you want me. You guide my steps. Let your purpose prevail in my life. If it, if it isn't of you, if you aren't in it, I don't want it. I believe he honors that. You are free to live every part of your life. To the glory of God. He says if it is the Lord's will. We will live. And do this. Or that. I like the way that's phrased. Because it really says. That there's a lot of things in our life's work. And in some other daily activities. That aren't as important. As we like to make them. Sound. That we're being faithful to God. That we're walking with God. That we are honoring him is more important than some of the, the fancy trappings that the world is so um, bothered with. We'll do this or that, and, and we are to do. James anticipates that we will be active for God, that we will serve Him. He expects us that we will be doers of the Word. He's already covered that in this um, written work for us. And, and he's, he's also uh, saying that we're going to plan and we're going to do business, we're going to work and we're going to provide for our families. Um, because, after all, the Bible says, if anybody does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And uh, uh, we pray in order that we might live a life worthy of God, uh, Colossians 1, and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. And we can grow in the knowledge of God even as we're earning a living. And even as he is... Uh, leading us to interact with all kinds of groups of people or serving Him in a ministry. We learn and we grow the knowledge of God when we put these things into practice. Plan, prepare, be committed and dependable, active servants, evaluate the work, take it seriously, absolutely. Because it bothers me sometimes when people say, well, you know, God doesn't want us to plan. You just kind of wing it any old way. I don't know about that. Yeah, there's sometimes we're in a circumstance we didn't know about, couldn't have been aware of, and we have to just step out and trust Him. And, and I get that. Um, but I believe that God wants us to be seeking where He is and planning and being ready to be used by Him. There were, uh, back in the day, uh, those preachers who would say, well, you never plan for a sermon, just flip open a Bible and whatever page flops <laughs> open to start preaching from that. I don't know about that. It's not the way I was taught. And I don't think that's what the scripture would uh, say God honors. Plan and prepare. And then if that occasion comes open, like, whoops, didn't know this one was coming up. Because you prepared. God can use what you have to say. And he'll give you the words too. So honor God in everything. Might seem like verse 17 kind of doesn't go with the others. I think that there's a connection. More than just avoiding the wrongs of life, this is the verse that tells us about what we call sins of omission. Anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Anyone who wants to out of pride or adultery or some other reason, uh, wants to, to take over their lives and take control over their lives instead of doing what this says to do or are humbling themselves or submitting their lives and treating other uh, brothers and sisters in Christ well as the other verses in the chapter talk about. 
If we don't do it, we know we ought to do, we sin. The good that we ought to do. So honor God in everything. Our life involves all of our being, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Doing this or that, whatever our work, whatever our hands find to do, working at it with all of our strength, because that honors Him. Do we honor job, honor God in our jobs, in how we do the work, in our integrity? Honor God as a student in how you uh, do your schoolwork. You can honor God in whatever He has given you to do. And then as you make plans and you look to the future and, and you consider what it is that uh, God may be leading you to do, verse 15, say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this or that. Amen. God, thank you for your word tonight. I just thank you and praise you.